بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى ولا سيما سيدنا محمد المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله اهل الصفا ورضي الله عن اصحابه وازواجه وذرياته اهل الوفاء وعمل لاثاره مقتفى واهتدى اما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته definitely not worth of all the good things my brother uh, Sheikh Khaled mentioned. Um, let's start from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic narration that Al-Nasai rahimahullah ta'ala created amongst others and Jabir and others in asdaq al-hadith kitab Allah ta'ala وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. So since أصدق الحديث كتاب الله let's start with كتاب الله تعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. This book, no doubt, in it there is guidance for those who believe. When you want to know people, usually you try to get close to them. That's one way of getting to know them. That's usually the best way of getting to know them. You can always get to know them through third parties. What this person or that person so says about them. And eventually then you'll try to find out whether what you know, if you get to eventually know them, is has any share of the truth. To as when you know them. It seems like there is a portion of knowledge that you may get first, and then that portion of knowledge may check up with the reality and may not. There are three questions that are very important for us to ask ourselves. And I know that we can substantiate them from the text. Like, and in general, if we look at them from a general perspective, where from, where to, and why? Those are framework questions. Where from, where do we come from? Where to, where are we going? What is the end of all this? And then, why? The, the reason they're important is because that keeps you in check. Because oftentimes we lose focus. Where from, where to, and why? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. We all know that. So I have الله لا إله إلا هو. There's no God but Him. There is no deity but Him. There is no creator but Him. And Allah started this ayah by his own name, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. La ilaha illahu. Al-Hayy. Al-Qayyum. The one who is attributed with life. The one who is Qayyum. And Qayyum means 
self-sustenant, means everlasting with no end, means the one who is not in need of anything, yet everything is in need of him for everything. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. He's not subject to sleep. He's not subject to imperfections. يعلم ما بين أيديهم من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه. Who is that who is going to intercede with him except with his permission? من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه. يعلم ما بين أيديهم. He knows that that is before them and that that is behind them and that's coming after them. He knows the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. And they cannot know what he knows or part of what he knows except except if he tells them وَلَا يَعُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيِّ Al-Azim, Allah sees the ayah by saying he is Al-Ali, the superior, Al-Azim, the glorified, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's introducing himself to you. So you don't know about, you can go and know about Allah from other things. I'm not saying necessarily bad sources, no good sources. But in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing himself to you, him to you directly. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyuf. It's one thing to know, it's one thing to know about, uh, it's one thing to know about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through other things. And it's another when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself to you directly. Okay. Because the point that where from, where to, and why, your whole access of your existence is that you get to know your creator. That you get to know Allah, not just to know about Allah. Not just to know Mawlana. Amir. Not just to know about Allah, but to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's one thing to know about Allah. He's al Rahim, he's al Kareem, he's al Ghafoor. It's another to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He introduced himself to you in the Sahih al Kursi among other ayahs, but this one is direct. So you don't, you know, here it is. Allah la ilaha illa. Allah. لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. You get the message. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. له من الذي يشفع عنده لم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض. To him belongs everything that's on earth or in heavens. Knowing about him, knowing him. <coughs> All right, so you know about him. Very good. But knowing him is not easy. Lots of people know about him. Very few people know him. Lots of people know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Very few people know him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lots of people talk about him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Few people know him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Similarly, 
and not comparing the creation to the creator. That can people talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and very few people are conscientious or they are actually knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously in a way that suits the human being because the human being cannot encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To say it's difficult is not to say it's impossible because Sunnah Sharifah makes it clear when Anas, Hadith Muslim, Hadith Muslim on the authority of Anas where he says, Huffati al Jannatu bil Makari. Jannah itself, and Jannah is a creation, it's surrounded by difficulties. In other words, there are tests. You can't get to Jannah, it's not a walk in the park, it's not an easy thing. Now, it's not an impossible thing, but it's not easy when a Nabi says, al Jannah is surrounded by difficulties, and Nar is surrounded by lots of desires. So it seems like it takes, it takes some kind of polishing of the soul or polishing of the self in order to elevate oneself so one then can see and can walk and go to Jannah. Well, that's a creation, and the Creator is not compared to the creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Jannah, it's not easy to get to know, and that's why as soon as solves this problem for you, so you stop seizing, or in other words, seize your imaginations, because an eye has not seen and an ear has not heard. You can say whatever you want. Huh? But then when the hadith comes and tells you an eye has not seen, فِيهَا مَا لَا عِينُ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ In it, that which an eye has never seen and an ear has never heard and will not occur to the mind of a human being. It's just telling you that you just can't really think about it. And that separates our deen and our journey in this life and to, and to ask yourself, Ya Habibi, where from, where to, and why? That journey of, of you where you are to the end of that journey, why? What are you doing this for? Do you know about him or do you know him? Are you getting close to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you getting close to knowledge that has to do with him? Because in Islam, as you probably all know, ilm doesn't necessarily mean knowledge, per se. Ilm doesn't necessarily mean knowledge. Because if knowledge means information, then ilm does not necessarily mean information. Everybody's got information. Google has more information than all of us combined here. But information is not realization, ma'rifa. Because information, again, is supposed to take you through transformation to realization. Information that actually is transformative to a state of a realization. But if that information doesn't transform you, it doesn't matter how much information you have, it makes absolutely no difference. Hadith al you all know, the first person that goes to Jahannam and Yadullah is someone who ta'allam wa qara' al Quran. Hadith Sahih. Information by itself is not the point. It's the transformation that really matters. The transformation to what? To that realization that changes you. You become changed as a human being. You become Rabbani. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَلَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَلَكِنْ كُونُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ But you ought to be Rabbani. Now, is that process taking place or you're still in the information? That's something that you have to judge. But in this journey of your life, where from, where to, in this journey from A to Z, let's say, you have to ask yourself that question, where am I going? What is, what is, what is it that I am looking for? What is it? Pleasing X, Y, Z? What is your benchmark 
figure A, figure B, figure C? Or is it how close you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I, I think I shared that with the brothers yesterday. Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, and Abu Hamid, rahimahullah ta'ala, he shared something in one of his writings about some people who saw Imam Al Junaid, Al Baghdadi, rahimahullah. Al Junaid, Al Baghdadi, you know, and big, big man, Sayyidu Taifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, wa bi anhu. And allegedly, those people, allegedly, I said that because there's no sanat to it, so take it or leave it. Whatever you like. Allegedly, some people saw Al Junaid al Baghdadi after he passed away. And they told him, Al Junaid is Junaid. You all know Al Junaid. Yani the language of Al Junaid, the language of the haqqaiq that Al Junaid used to be, speak with is not really given to many people. So Al Junaid is Al Junaid. And then they allegedly saw him after he passed away and they said, Ya Abu Al Qasim, yani Al Junaid is his, name, his nickname. What happened? How did Allah treat you? How, how was it after you passed away? And he said, Al Ghazali said, he said three things. He says, Tahatil ibarat wa faniyatil isharat. He says, all these ibarat, all these fancy statements, and all these isharat signs and things, and the multi multiple dimension, dimensions of things that we used to say, they're all, they all perished, they all evaporated, they're all gone. And the only thing benefited us is few rak'ahs we used to pray at the end of the night. SubhanAllah. Because like you said, you all know that. Talk the talk the talk versus walk the walk. We became masters of talk, so I mean, you know. I don't think we need, you know, you know we're good at that. That information that you have, in whether it's the 21st century and now we just went back to the 2nd century with the Imam al junaid it comes down, it's relative. Time is relative all the time. Is it taking you to a realization? Have you taken your journey in the 21st century or in the 1st century, whatever century you're in, have you taken your personal journey to find Allah? Or you haven't? You're still following signs, different signs. And I don't mean find, obviously, you know, finding him in a way that's suitable to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there that motive within you? Are you looking for him? Are you searching for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in what you're doing? Or is this X and Y and Z is that's what matters. Or in this whole chaos of that life that we're living, that whole question is, how is my heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or am I searching for him that doesn't even exist, not even asked, how is your heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today? Is it better than last year? This time? Are you, in other words, is your heart, are you closer to Allah Ta'ala today than you were last week or last year? Or you're further away from Him? Or it's indifferent? You have no, you know, it makes no, you, do you have a heart? Or we're just doing the rituals and we're going on with it. And we're, we, you know, we're glorifying everyone and and seeking everyone's pleasure except him, Jalla Jalalu. You're looking at all the signs except the sign to him. You're running towards every, every direction except to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created all the directions. That's something that sh everyone has to answer on their own because this is your own journey to Allah. Everyone is taking their own journey. And Nabi Akram sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam gave you the framework, showed you the path, well traveled. Khayru al hadi hadi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, You want guidance? 
Don't worry about anybody else's. It's the guidance of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That's why he says, wa najmi idha hawa ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. By the star, by the falling star, your companion is not misguided. Yani an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not subject to misguided. And Allah starts it with an najm. By the star. Though the najm is, or the stars are, means for guidance. Allah says, Wa bin najmi hum yahtadun. They're guided by the stars. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to put this here so you understand that the star on earth is the guidance for that star in heavens. <laughs> because the star in heavens may fall, but the star on earth will never fall. The journey that you have to take, because everyone will, ask, will be asked on themselves account individually. Every single one will be asked individually. That's your journey. How is that journey? Have you found him yet? How is your heart with Allah to start with? Is it close? Is it far away? You're just doing the deen as rituals and you think that's it. So everyone figures that on their own. And everyone has to answer for their own. No one can answer on your behalf. Let me take you through, let's go to a young man. Let's accompany a young man for a bit. Young man whose father was up in the society, among those people who are, you know, up and well to do. He put him in a temple, this young man. And that temple, you sh what, what it does is, it glorifies fire, worships fire. He, he stayed with that fire thing. Just didn't do it. It didn't do it. He's looking for him. That young man has that, there's a drive in him. He's trying to find out why. Where from? Where to? He's trying to connect to his creator. And that fire did not quench that thirst. So he says one day, Anyway. This young man kept with the fire until he got promoted. He's now the guy that is in charge of keeping the fire lit. So other people can always come and worship it and glorify it. He just didn't do it for him. And there's that drive. He's trying to look for the creator. One day he says, my father, I'm trying to sort of summarize the hadith. The hadith is very long. One day he says he's, his father sent him to do a business in the next village. He says, so I went. And my father asked me to come back before night time. He says, on the way to that next village, I saw a bunch of people gathering together and they're chanting and singing. It attracted me. He says, I went to them. And then they're singing and they're praying to God. He says, I like that. I asked them, they seem to be Christians, he said. So he said, I spent the whole day with them until nighttime. And I forgot about my father's chore that he accounted me with, that I need to go to the next village and come back to my old village. And when I came to my father, I returned back to my father empty handed. He says, where were you? I told him exactly what happened. And I told him, Father, I saw these people praying to a creator of earth and heaven, not just a fire. And then his father reprimanded him, says, but deen wa but your deen and what you believe is better than this. 
And this young man says, mm, I don't think so. It's not really fair. It's not really better. We're worshiping fire. Those guys are worshiping the Creator. He sent, so his father, when he saw him, that he wants to, he's, he's not conforming. He told him, you can't leave now the temple until, you know, until I tell you. So he sent a letter to, those, to that church, that Christian church. He's saying, you know, where do you get your deen from? They told him from the land of the Levant, Asham, which is now, let's say, primarily Syria. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the difficulties and the hardship from the people of Syria and all people in the world. This place was in Persia, where this young man was. And that Christianity, or where those people belonged to at that time, was in the land of the Levant, in Asham, in Syria. He told them, whenever you have a convoy coming from Asham and returning, alert me to it. I want to accompany them secretly and leave the, the lands of Persia all the way traveling to the lands of the Levant. So I see where that deen is. He's searching. There's that motive. So a few months go by, and then some people come from the, from the land of the Levant, and they send this young man now a message saying, look, we have a caravan ready to go to depart Persia all the way to the land of the Levant. If you want, you need to join us at this point in time. He now sneaks out of the temple, gets his bag, and joins that caravan, the Christian caravan, until he gets to them, and then takes that long travel from Persia all the way to Asham. He gets there. Days, weeks, he says, where is the biggest one? The most knowledgeable in your deen, in that faith. So they take him to that big place of worship or church in that place. And he goes and tells the big man, the biggest scholar there, the, I'm still with the hadith, huh? the verbatim of the hadith, but I'm not going through every word because it's long. He says, can I serve you? Would you accept me as a servant of you in the church and you teach me? He says, sure. You can always use young people, good people. He says, I served him years until that priest or that scholar, that Christian scholar then was on his deathbed. And he, I asked him on his deathbed, I said, oh, teacher, in fact, the first one, let's say he died, that person died. So the people around came and glorified that man, glorifying that figure. Who knows who was serving him best for years? This young man. So they buried him and they're doing all these things. This young man told them, I have a secret to tell you. They said, what? He said, this big man of yours was not really big after all. He said, well, you know, I served him for years. All the charities that you used to give him, to give it to other people, he would go and put it in his own, and he would stack it in the bottom of the church somewhere. He said, are you sure? He said, yeah, show us. So he says, he went and took seven qilal, seven big jars of silver and gold. These people were giving things, and the man was putting it, you know, on his own. So now the hadith says that they took him out of the grave, after they put him in the grave, they took him out of the grave and they crucified him dead. Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes you go straight. <laughs> and then died, I mean. <laughs> he says, now after this, now they put someone who's really pious. This young man, now he's been serving the church for a while. He says, can I serve you? He says, yes. And this young man, he says, I served him for years. I have not seen anyone more pious than this man. He prays. He gives the charity. I have not seen anyone like him in my life. 
Hmm? He so says, I served him. He served him for years and years until that scholar or that, uh, that man now who is knowledgeable is on his deathbed. He's seen now everything that there was in the land of the Levant and he never seen anyone like it. On his deathbed, he says, teacher, that young man, or maybe no longer a young man anymore, he says, I have served you for years. Where do I, now you're dying, where do I go after you? I want someone that can guide me to him. As if the trip, the journey was okay, but he has not found him yet. He has not found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet. <coughs> Who can guide me after you? He says, there is no one like me on earth except some person in northern Iraq. And he put the city, and that so-so-and-so city, go to him. He says, then my teacher died, I buried him. And then I took my things and I traveled from the land of the Levant all the way to Iraq. I went to that man in that church of his. I said, so-and-so, your friend sent me to you and they said he said that there's no one like you on earth can i please serve you and learn from you he says yes he says i served that man and he was just like my teacher the most pious the most knowledgeable and the most gentle and i learned from him so much and i cannot see there's no one like him after that second teacher he says, and I served him. He served him for years until also that teacher now is on his deathbed. That's the third teacher. He says on his deathbed, I said, teacher, who do I go after you? That young man, that, that journey and quest to find him did not stop there. He could have been whatever he wanted in that church. He, has, he had learned all the, you know, the paper, ilm, things that are in the books. He could probably spit him out better than anyone else at that time. Regurgitate him backwards. If he wants to look like one of those big people at that time, it was easy for him because he had already served so many of them. But he was looking in his heart. Because sometimes, not just ilm, not just knowledge that you acquire may be a veil, veiling you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just the ego that you may have, may be the veil veiling you from being close to Him. Even the shari ilm, even the ilm that you acquire in the deen itself, that may even veil you from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your goal is the ilm about Him. Not to him. You want to know about him. Him is different than about him. And about him should lead to him, but not all the time. This young man, or no longer young man, if you want to say, he says, now you're dying, who do you leave me to? He says, I'm going to have you go to someone on the face of the earth, he told him. There's no one like me except one other person who's in so-and-so city. Travel to him. So he says, after my teacher died, I buried him, all these things. And then I left where I was. And I went now to the new teacher. So-and-so sent me to you, master. Can you teach me? Can I serve you? Would you allow me to serve you? And then you can teach me? He says, yes. So he says, I now served him. He stayed with that fourth teacher and he served him and learned from him. He said he was just as pious as the last two teachers. Pious, God-fearing. He's getting close to Allah. He's knowing more. He says, he served him basically for years until that fourth teacher is also on his deathbed now he's dying he says i asked him who do you leave me to where do i go where do i go after you please point me somewhere i go 
despite now this young man or this man mm. acquiring so much knowledge and the summary of the life of every single teacher, acquiring that summary and being elevated in that knowledge, that information may have led to transformation. It transformed him, but that realization was not where it needed to, where it needed to be. The ma'rifa, the maqam of ma'rifa was not where it needed to be. That young man's drive was still there. I need to find him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have acquired lots of knowledge and lots of status if I want to hold on to about him. You know how some people have the deen serving them rather than them serving the deen? In other words, the deen propels. They use the deen, they step on it so they can be where they need to be, where their aspiration or ambition. It's one, and Islam doesn't want you not to be ambitious, obviously. Islam wants you to be ambitious. Wants you to have all the ambition you can. But you don't step on people for your ambition. Let alone the deen. The deen yearns. The deen, Islam yearns for people who selflessly want to serve. The deen is the deen of Allah, you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about what people say, Islam, Islam under attack, no, no, don't worry about that. Rest assured, sit, and just calm down, and you know, let me just put it in, in, in layman language, take a chill pill. It's the deen of Allah. You, know, you think that Islam is dependent on me and you and all of us to protect and have? No, 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 Allah. You are protected if you serve it. And by being attached to it, you're being blessed. It's the deen of Allah. You don't have to worry about that. It's not Islam that I worry about. It's Muslims that we worry about. But Islam is the deen of Allah. You know, hey, it's been 1,400 years. Many things have happened. Worse than that. Look at the Sahaba If you look at the history of the Sahaba, may Allah be well pleased with all of them. And some people were killed and their properties were confiscated and all these things. Ask Sumayya and ask Ammar, the parents of Am uh, Yasir, the parents of Ammar bin Yasir, the first female murder that was murdered simply for the La ilaha illallah. There was no zakah and, and, and there was no siyam yet and there was no salah yet and there was all these things. They were not there yet. Ask Bilal about the scars that he had. Bilal, the Abyssinian slave at that time. He was a master, he was no slave, but to people he was a slave, supposedly. Ask him about the scars that he had for to be liberated. Ask, ask, ask. No, no, I mean, you know, this, you know Muslims are no way, you know, they have not. In the trials, that first generation, they held those trials on their shoulders. So we can have it now easily and nicely, and we can sit and, you know, chit-chat about it in a very nice atmosphere. Anyway, he says, teacher, where do I go? Where do I go after you? He says, there's only one man in this world that's like me. Everyone tells him there's only one. What is this? There's only one man. Where is it? In the land of Rome, the Romans. In the land of the Romans. So he sent him all the way, he says, to the land of the Romans. He says, so he took that travel, and look how he's traveling from one to the other, to the other, and all the way. Now this young man, after four, or no longer a young man, probably. After this long, he goes now, he travels to the land of the Romans, or, you know, at that time, they called Europeans Romans. Huh? Or anyone who was white, they called them Romans in a sense. So, I mean, they called them Bani Asfar, the people who are yellow. That's how Arabs called them at that time. So you're either black or Arab or yellow. I mean, don't take it racially, whatever it is. Bani Asfar, they used to call them. Anyway, I mean, you know, whatever it is. You know, I don't think that Greek is yellow anyway. I mean, the Greeks, I think Syrians are even more fair than the Greeks, but anyway. And they're Europeans. No offense, no, no offense to anybody. I mean, okay, if you go to Northern Europe and they're yellow, okay, maybe. But anyway, I'm not going there. But also remember that Syria was occupied by the Romans. Before Muslims came there, 
Europeans were in Syria. So that's, that's hence the blood, or hence the color, etc., whatever you want to call it. Anyway, and on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith sahih, Intermediate and others narrated Jubbatun Rumiya. He, he had a Jubba that's Rumiya. Another Riwaya, Jubba Shamiya. Well, some of the hadith scholars they say, but there is Ta'arud, there is contradiction. How can, it, how can the Jubba be Shami, Syrian, and how can it be Roman? Well, there's no really Ta'arud, there's no contradiction because the Romans were in Syria, that's why. But anyway, some other time we'll talk about that. Um, this man now, this young man goes all the way to the land of the Romans now, and he sees the teacher. He says, uh, look, so-and-so sent me, and before him I was with so-and-so, and before him I was with so-and-so, and before him I was, so, you know, all the teachers died, they're all old, old people, and he lived with them, and he took the summary of the knowledge, and he, they died. He says, now, uh, there's no one but you. Can I come, and can you, would you teach me? He says, yes, you stay with me. He said, that man had a farm, that scholar, that big scholar that's the only one left, he had a farm. He says, so I stayed with him, and he taught me also how to do these things. He says, now I grew a little wealth. I had three cows and some sheep. <laughs> cows are expensive, even nowadays. He says, I stayed with him until, you know, so he lived year with him, with him until that teacher also had, is dying. So after all these years, that teacher is on his deathbed. This young man goes to him and tells him, but teacher, now where do I go? Where do I go? Please point me somewhere where I need to go. Notice the quench, uh, that, that thirst has not been quenched yet. He's trying to find him. He's trying to look for him. He learned about him, but he did not find him yet. Hmm? That, that scholar that, that this young man was with, he said, he looked at him and he says, son, that era has already entered. The age has already come now. You already entered that era. So the few years that he spent with him made him enter. He said, you have entered the era where there will be a prophet coming from the Arabs. You need to go there and look for him. But he's in the land of the Romans. What do you mean go to the Arabs? To Arabs, where do they live? In the desert. Desert. desert is big. Where do I go? He says he's got three signs. Number one, he does not eat charity, but he eats if you give him a gift. If it's a hadiyah, he eats it. Charity, he doesn't eat it. And there is a sign, the seal of prophecy on him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What else? The teacher died. He says, during those days, a tribe from Kalb, Kalb is a tribe. Al Kalbiyun, Bani Kalb. He says, they came to Hadith Musnad Ahmad still, huh? This, I'm not telling you a story. I don't tell stories. I don't like to tell stories. We're still in the Hadith. Sayyidina Ali used to, uh, you know, the used to kick the storytellers out of the masjid. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, no, nowadays, Habibi, we're spending our time with Alice in Wonderland stories. I want to know the dean. Then we can talk about Alice. <laughs> Yeah, the deen is the book and the authentic sunnah. That's what I mean by the deen. Then we, then we talk about all these other ones. He says, I saw these tribes from Kel. I said, are you going back to your, to your homeland in the desert? I said, yes. He said, look, all I have, I have all these cows and all these sheep. Can I give them to you as a, 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 a fee for you taking me with you? He doesn't have to. He just can go with them. He doesn't have to give them anything. He says, I gave them everything I have, which is the wealth in return that they what? 
they just take me to that teacher that my teacher told me about. Because oftentimes we think, and this is how the people who are detached, he's looking for him. And because he's looking for him, whatever he has is for the sake of him. You know why? Because if you find him, then you found everything. If you have everything and you haven't found him, then you did not find anything. If you don't have him and you have everything, you don't have anything. He know he knew that whatever he has, if he doesn't have him, makes no difference. Why? Where from, where to, and why? He wanted to find him. Once he finds him, he found everything he needs. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Alayhi sallahu bi abda. Isn't Allah enough for his slave? Al-Quran answers, asks. Al-Quran asks a question. Isn't Allah enough for his slave? Alayhi sallahu bi abda. Bala. Indeed. But which abd? The true abd. Not any abd. There are people who are, who are abd for their own shahawat, abd for their own, their own fame and name and desires in this dunya. They're slaves for them. They're enslaved for what they want. And there are some who are enslaved to Allah truly. Hmm? Abda. That's why Allah puts this, there's this ha, huh? Yani, isn't Allah enough for his slave? Why does he, what does he say? His slave, abda. Aren't we all his slaves? Yeah, we are all his slaves by creation. But his slaves are different. Huh? Rahman. Aren't we all Ibadur Rahman? Yeah, by creation. But the Ibad of Rahman, they have different characteristics. Everybody has those characteristics. There's, there's, there's difference. Allah distinguishes Ibad al-Rahman from the other Ibad that they claim to be Ibad al-Rahman. Those Ibad al-Rahman, they walk on earth, uh, on earth with peace and ease. And when the ignorant slander them, they don't slander them back. Why? Why, why, why if you're Ibad al-Rahman, you'll be slandered by the ignorance? Well, that's what Allah says anyway. So I don't know about you, huh? وَإِذَا خَطَبَهُمُ الْجَعْلُ قَالُوا سَلَامَ عَلَيْهِ we don't have business with the jahilin. We don't dignify the jahil with an answer. Yeah? And they stay, and Allah describes how Ibadur Rahman, they stay at night. Sujudan wa qiyama. They're in sujood and qiyam. After all this, what do they do? Oh Allah, take us away from that punishment. Huh? For that punishment. Those are the Ibad of Rahman. Not everyone is like that. And that's why Allah says, to Iblis, inna ibadi, my slaves. sultan. You have no way onto them, O Iblis. What do you mean? You mean sometimes, what do you mean Iblis has no way to some ibad of Allah? Yeah, not all the ibad. Sometimes, actually, Iblis is playing chess with everybody else. And in a sense, what I mean is some people's actions put Iblis himself to shame. Metaphorically speaking, yeah, I mean, there may, if there's such thing like that. Yeah, yeah, some people are more shayateen than shaytan himself. Human beings, huh? Al-Nas, yani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنْسِ وَالْجِنْ He puts ins of shayateen before jinn. It seems like the shayateen of the ins are worse than the shayateen. It's a heavier, heavier level than the shayateen of jinn. But anyway. He tells them, this young man, can I give you all I, I look, I don't want anything from this thing. All I have is these cows and sheep just take me to where my teacher said, take me to the desert, I will look. They don't know what he's looking for, he will look. They said, yes, no problem. They took the sheep and the cows, and they took him with him in the caravan, and they, they drove, or they, uh, they, uh, they, they went, they walked all the way from the land of Romans to the Arabian desert. As soon as they got to the Arabian desert, they bonded him up, sold them into slavery. Well, they're in the Arabian desert now, that's their own territory. They tied up the man, he's coming in. 
you know, now we brought you, we got the money, and uh, let's see. You may be useful for something. Let's just sell you into slavery. So they sold him into slavery to a Yehudi from the Arabian desert. This man, he comes from a royal family. He was in charge of the fire and the temple and all these things. And you know, he did. And he gave them what they want, not only what they want, he gave them more than what they ever asked, would ask, ever ask for. Why would you do this? Yeah. Welcome to human beings. Don't put your trust except in Allah. I'm not saying mistrust people. But trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you trust him, he will never let you down. People will. Allah tells us, which means whoever relies on Allah, Allah will suffice him. Where is your talk from? On money, on power, on your connections, on who you know? Where did you talk about? He or she who relies on Allah truly, Allah will suffice them. All right. Try it. Try it. Don't just read it. Try it. Okay. So now they sell this man into slavery. This Yahudi took him and he started working for him. He says, I served him also. I served him, it seems like, also for some time. He says, until he had visitors, another Yahudi person came to him from Bani Qurayza. Remember Bani Qurayza? Where did they used to live? In Yathrib at that time. Or what eventually was called Medina. And there was some Yahud there in, from Bani Qurayza. And this man had relatives with this Yahudi in the middle of the Arabian desert, so he came to visit him. He says, he saw me, and he saw me that I am a hard-working slave. So he asked my master, can I buy him off of you? I need him. He's good. With the trees and all these things, they see. He says, OK. He says, so my master sold me to another one of his relatives. Now he's been sold twice into slavery. He says, this master now, I went with him, this Yahudi master, I went with him to the tents of Bani Qurayla, which is outside of what is called Medina. At that time, it's Yathrib. We call it Medina. He says, I'm now helping him with the trees. This young man said, well, no longer a young man after, after all these years, is he? Or oh, young is always a number, isn't that true? But no, but actually, no longer a young man, probably. He says, I'm on the tree, working on the tree, and I hear my master, my slave master, and one other relative of his talking at the bottom of the tree, talking about a man. Now, obviously, this man has been sold in slavery, but he came there for, for a goal. He says, I'm hearing them talking about some man who is coming to Medina now, or yesterday, and that... He is claiming to be a prophet. He says, I almost fell off of the tree. This is what years have passed by, but you see, he did not let it go. He did not let the dunya and everything that happened to him bad. And he started weeping, I'm a royal prince. How come they put me into slavery, all these things? Because his search for Allah has much higher priority. If I need, if I'm going to be sold into slavery, then eventually that will take me to a place to find him, then that's where I need to be. Whether I find him or not, that's not the point I'm going to try. I either find him or I will die trying. He says, I almost fell off. Fell off the tree. Because now my, my teacher who told me, he said the truth. And you know, you're holding on to a few words. That's all you have. You don't have anything else. He says, I came down quickly. <coughs> I said, well, what, tell me, tell me about it. He says, my, ma my slave master took his hand and he slapped me so hard, I almost fell. He says, what is this business with you? Go and do your business. You know, go work. He says, I went back and worked at night when I was free. I had some food. I took it. And I went all the way to Quba where they told me that that prophet that came from Mecca is 
I walked until I went. I saw him with some of his companions. He said, I heard you're coming. You're a stranger. You're not from here. You're coming from somewhere else, from Mecca. Here is some food for you and your companions. You're a stranger. Please eat. It's a charity food. He said he accepted it from me. And he told his, com he told his companions, please eat. But I watched him. He didn't even touch it. His teacher already told him he won't eat charity. He said, I didn't say anything. I looked at him. He says, I went back. Next day, I worked the whole day. At night, I cooked some food, whatever I could. I took it again, and I came back to him. He says, I know you're still a stranger. Here's some food. This is a gift from me. I made it for you. It's not charity. He says he ate from it. He found the treasure. He's, he's looking, he's getting close. Huh? Until obviously another event, I, let me cut the hadith short. The hadith is long, please go ahead and read it. It says until I saw the seal and then these, these signs, when I saw the seal, he says one time then, uh, one day, and then I walked behind him. I want to see that seal of prophecies. Once I saw that, I went down crying. I hugged him and I started crying. Obviously, we're talking about Salman. Right? Salman Faris, radiallahu ta'ala. He says, I saw him and then I went on him crying. Salman, radiallahu anhu, now, you know, they say he was 200 years old, whatever. I don't know how many hundreds of years old he was. But he says, I now I went on him وسلم, crying. I found finally what I was looking for. Because that man will lead me to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, he found all the teachers. But his case did not rest. He stayed with them until they led him to the next, to the next, to the next. But once he found Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he knew now that's the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where's your trip? Where's your journey? Where's your journey? Did you find him yet? Or you're, stick, you're still, as Allah told us in the Quran, Nasullah fa ansahum and fusahum. They forgot about Allah, and Allah made them forget themselves. How, how do people forget themselves? In Hadith al Rawal Bayha Fit al Zuhd, we said Abu Ba'if. Allegedly, that Allah, or Dawood, tells Allah, أين الرب أين ألقاك أو أين أجدك لفظ الليلة في ألقاك أو الله where do I find you داود عليه السلام is asking allegedly where do I find you he says عند المنكسرة قلوبهم من أجلي at those whose hearts are broken for me When do people rush towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually? When they're deep trouble. When they try everyone they know and rely on everything that they have, whether it's money, wealth, health, connection, power, everything, and everything fails them. One after the other. Boom, boom, boom. You know, you, you try all the doors that you thought you got it. And all the doors close, shut right in your face, and everyone that you thought will fail you. What do you do then? You go to the city with Ya Allah. Ya Allah. I have no one but you. Where do you find where do I find you, O Allah? At those whose hearts are broken for me. That's when you run to him. Hmm? That's when you try to find him. Because now you realize that you're weak and you're broken. No one can mend your heart but him. Though after he mends your heart, you run away from him again. He grants you what you want. 
Many times you've asked him, all of us, Ya Allah, if you just give me this, I promise. He gives you. He gives you not only what you asked, even more so that you forget that he gave you what you asked in the first place. Because he covers you so much with his ni'mas that you even forget what you asked and you forget what you asked in the first place. He gives you even bigger and better. Only that you forget him more and more. But he is so kareem and so kind, latifun bi'ibadih, that he keeps giving you. You declare this obedience against him every day, publicly, and every day, every day, he renews his endowments upon you, completely and even more. How does that happen? We don't know because we only know Allah latifun bi'ibadih. Allah is latif. Maybe then you can find him. Maybe you can find him through that lutf that he's showing you. Because no one would show that lutf, no one would show that kindness unto you ever. Not your father, not your mother, not your family. Huh? No one, not your children, no one will show that. And Ali Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says Allah is more kind, which means Allah is more kind unto you than the breastfeeding mother to her baby. Hmm? Where do you find that? You can. But he gives you more so that you may find him through his kindness. Sometimes we only learn through hardships. But he's still kind. Even through hardships, he's still kind. He tries, he, 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 stuff from, I didn't mean to say try, but he takes you through it, navigates you through it in a good way that's suitable to his generosity and majesty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why, and you say this hadith is da'if, Shaykh, why are you bringing this hadith? I'll give you the hadith is da'if, which is a shahid for this, to say the least. Hadith Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, and you all know the hadith. And I want you to pay attention to the verbatim of the hadith. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Hadith Qudsi al-Hadith. So Allah is telling us, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is informing us. He says, Abdi maridtu falam tazurni. Literally, it would mean, and that's not the understanding of the Hadith. I'm going to say it literally, and that's not what it is, because it's inapplicable to the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdi maridtu. Maridtu fa'i'ani ta'al fa'il mutahrika taqdirwa ana maridtu. It would mean, I have fallen sick. Oh my slave, I have fallen sick. No, I have fallen sick. I have fallen sick. I have fallen sick. Okay. It would mean that, oh my slave, I have fallen sick. You have not visited me. And the slave says, but Ya Allah, how can I visit you? Wa anta rabbul alameen. And you are the Lord of the universe of the worlds. And Allah tells us then in this authentic hadith, and pay attention to the wording. He says, Don't you know that my slave so and so has fallen sick? Don't you know had you visited that sick slave of mine? You would have found me there. You would have found me. You see, the hadith continues to say, I asked you for food, you haven't given me food. The slave says, how can I give you food? And then he tells you, so and so of my slaves was, was hungry. Don't you know, had you fed him, you would have found the reward of that with me. You would have found the reward of that with me. And the first one he said, you would have found me there. I would found you with the people who are sick. When people are sick and they know no one can help them, who do they go to? Allah. Allah. When you know no one can help you, no one can be there for you, no one can do anything, 
go Allah. So those people who are sick, then they find themselves there with Allah. And that's why the hadith is directing you. If you had visited them, you would have found me there. Because I am close to those who are close to me. Didn't he tell us that? Didn't he tell us that? That I am close to those who are close to me? Yeah. Those who are close to him, he's close to them. Then if you're sincerely close to him, he's close to you. And if you want to find him, you would have found me there. SubhanAllah. Where is your journey? Where is your journey? Well, you see the surah, إِنَّمَا بِسْمَ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامِ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ Ya Salam. They feed, they give the food. يُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامِ They give the food. Why do they give the food? They have no food. But they give the food anyway. عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ Because out of their love. Love to whom? To Allah. مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا they give it to a miskeen, a poor, yatim, an orphan, and a prisoner as well. You know the events for the ayah, very simple. Let me just go through them real quick. I don't want to take too much of your time today or tonight. Uh, uh, the Mufassirin bring this narration anyway. It's known that the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Fatima, Radiallahu Ta'ala, Anhuma, and the Hassan al Hussein. There's no food in the house. Sayyidina Ali goes to work the whole day, brings some dough for enough to make some bread. Sayyidina Fatima makes that bread before Maghrib because they're fasting. You have nothing to, you have no food, so I might as well fast. Right before Maghrib comes, somebody knocks the door. Ya ala bayt al nubuwa. O household of the Prophet. What is it? It says, there's a miskeen. Miskeen is knocking your door. Do you have any food to give me? So they give him that only loaf of bread they have to him. And they now break their fast on water and they intend to fast the next day. So they fast the next day. And Ali goes to work. The household has nothing. Ali goes to work. At the end of the day, he breaks some dough in order for Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha to make us bread right before Maghrib time. Somebody knocks the door. Yes. He says, it's an orphan. I'm a yatim. I'm an orphan. Do you have anything to spare to give me so I can eat? So they give them, they give them that bread that they have, the only thing they have. They break their fast on water and intend to fast the next day. And the next day, the same thing, and someone knocks, he says, I'm a prisoner. Can you please give me something to eat? They give him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, They give the food for the love of Allah. See, he didn't say, for his sake. You could do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you could say, do something for the love of Allah ta'ala. Because they love him. Remember, Salman gave all the cows and the sheep. That's because I want to find you. Who cares if I have everything and I don't have you? If I have everything I don't have you, then I don't have anything. They gave everything. For his love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Miskinan wa yatiman wa asira. And then Allah says, we give you for the sake of Allah. So the love and then the sake. Notice, not sake and then love. Love and then sake. Because love makes you do something for the sake of someone. Hmm? Yeah, love, love, is, love is first, then itiba comes. Then following, not the other way around. The Quran says, we feed you, we give you for the sake of Allah. We don't anticipate, we don't want any thanks from you, no recognition. I don't want recognition. Salman gave everything, he doesn't want anything. I'm not trying to give you more than what you deserve to take me on the trip for you. Just take it all, who cares? In 
Let me finish with a couple of things. I mean, let me just. There's a lot of examples that, you know, Ibrahim ibn Adam, for example, he went for 20 years, they say, or more, looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He left everything he had. He was Sultan. He left everything he had. And he went roaming the deserts to look for him. To look for him. What do you mean, look for him? He's afraid. So they say they saw. The one man saw him one time at the Kaaba, and he's looking at one young man and crying. He says, Ya Aba Ishaq, why are you crying? Who's this young man you're looking at? He says, this is my son. I haven't seen him since I left looking for Allah, searching for Allah. So he says he went and he hugged him. He says, when I went and saw him, I want to be back with my family. But then I remembered I left them so I can search for him. I haven't found him yet. And then he said this famous line of poetry attributed to him. Again, attribution, take it or leave it, whatever you want. He says, تَرَكْتُ الْخَلْقَ طُرًّا فِي هَوَاكَ وَأَيْتَمْتُ الْعِيَالِ لِكَيْ أَرَاكَ I left all the khalq, Ya Allah. Ibrahim al saying, I left all the khalq, even my family, the most people I love. I left them. تَرَكْتُ الْخَلْقَ طُرًّا فِي هَوَاكَ Out of your love. Because I want your love. And I made my children orphans, practically, so I can see you. As long as I was seeing them, I wasn't able to see you and see them. So I had to leave so I can see you. And if I am cut to pieces in trying, in my attempt to search for you, my heart would not want anything but you. Even in my pieces, it would be yearning for you, Allah. And these are some of the things that some of the people did. I'm not saying you have to go to this extreme. What I'm saying is, where is your journey today? The deen today, oftentimes, it is turned into ritual rather than spiritual. The list, list, list of do's, and list of don'ts. This is what the deen is. The deen is unfortunately subject to barrage from every kind of, all kinds of challenges. Challenges within, challenges without, or from out. Challenges within the cult system that people want to make the deen into. A cult, a cult mentality, and a cult system where the benchmark becomes a figure other than Rasulullah other than the Quran and the Sunnah. And there is no such thing. There is no such thing. The deen can never be dwarfed in one personality after the Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in anyone. The deen is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone else has to follow the deen. Everyone else is obligated to follow the book and the Sunnah. The deen is bigger than all people. The deen is Rasulullah, yes. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everybody follows the deen. No one is a benchmark for anything. The Imam Malik, rahimahullah, no one, his words. Kullun minna yu'khadu minhu wa yu'addu alayhi illa sahib to me, except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone you can take and give back, except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the deen is big. It's not a club. It's not a cult. It's not one versus the other. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, you know why? Because you see, the Quran is from Allah, and Allah is a Rahim, the most compassionate. And the Sunnah is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Ra'ufun, Rahim. He's also Rahim. As far as the creation, he's the most compassionate. And no one in the banner of love, when we erect walls of exclusion under the banner of compassion and mercy of Islam, that's a cult system approach. That's not a deen. There are challenges. Sure. This is the, the tongue is the one that takes you down. So this one, I have a pebble on it. I don't talk the whole day. I'm good. Try to do the fast of Maryam. Why do you think I'm going to talk to you about the fasting of Maryam? 
إن رجل الرحمن صوم. حبيبي sometimes it's okay to do some fasting from talk. Because we always listen to ourselves. Sometimes we need to listen to our souls, not just our tongues. We always like to listen to our tongues speaking. Sometimes maybe we need to practice some silence where we let now the, the soul speak. Maybe you can sharpen your soul, your ears of the heart, so you hear your soul now, rather than just you hear your tongue. It's a good practice. Mariam did that before. You can also do that if you want. Say, I'm fasting today from talk. I'm not talking. That's the, that's the challenge we have. Again, it's something I always say and I always say. The beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala, sent the beloved out of love to teach love with love for the sake of love. Make no mistake about it. In, let me move out, challenges out in the 21st century. In the past century, in the 20th century, look, I know you're all, you know, you're all educated people, you're scholars in your field, and I respect that, and I love this, you all. So I don't, I'm not here to teach you, I'm here just to sort of remind myself and you. Human development has similar aspects, regardless what creed you are. Okay? I mean, religion is religion. But humanity moves in similar patterns, more or less. The human, human develops lots of similar ways. You all know what happened with the Christian community, especially here in Europe, that you are European. When Martin Luther first came, the reformist, Right? And you all know the thing that he put the 99 things he put on the church, right? You need to, for the Catholic Church at that time, you need to reform, otherwise you're we're in deep trouble. Because you people are now, you're not adaptive anymore. You're losing. You're becoming a tyrant, basically, what he's telling the church. Is that you're becoming a religious tyranny. And there's a problem with religious tyranny, I always say. But religious tyranny is not only, only, only to Christians or Jews or anybody else. No, no, no. We have religious tyranny also with our own. They didn't listen. So then you had John Calvin, if you remember the Calvinist movement. Similarly. Then you had the Church of England splitting entirely. Saying, you know what? Forget about you all. We're just going to have the Church of England and the Queen or the King will be ahead of the Church. Right? Notice that split. And then obviously had further splits, further splits, every, up until now. In the past century or, or before, after all these splits, obviously those splits did not just happen from nothing. The religion became just a ritual, became indoctrination, the, theoretical, theological indoctrinations and mental, I call it the mental tennis, Theoretical, theological, mental tennis. Who attains salvation is based on what idea do you have in your mind? We almost stripped it from positive contribution to self and society and everything else around us. You know, hey, you believe in this idea? And we make up ideas as we, as we go along sometimes. So that theolog theoretical, theological, mental tennis has sort of, con uh, sort of led to all this, all this fragmentation that happened. People in the past century did not just become not very religious. I'm talking about generally Europeans. Not just not very religious, especially in the West, Western part of Europe. They first not very religious, and then they became what we call secular. Then anti-religion. Not just secular. And there's nothing good in this religion. Just three, four generations ago, that, you know, hardcore. There's nothing good anymore. I don't believe any religion has, been, has sustained lots of slander and, and 
critics, criticism as Christianity, to be honest with you. If you think that people attack Islam, you haven't seen anything yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. It's just going to get worse. I mean, put it that way in, in sort of layman language. Okay, look at how, how, how many things they wrote about from, from within. How many things they wrote about the Bible and Sayyidina Isa and all these things. Just so you know, I mean, you know. And if we think it's bad, if you think it's bad now, may, may only Allah help us. It's not no more secular, it's now anti-religion. Anti, the concept of God. Make your own God. In the 19, when I first went to the US, and I immigrated to the United States in 1987 or so, after I went to the Masjid for a couple of years, and then I figured out, you know, I need to go and do something else on my own, so I went to the university. And I took some secular courses. What do you call secular? I mean, what do people call secular courses? I took some science courses. At that time, I mingled with some of the Muslim youth, and to them, this was the phrase that they used to use. I'm talking back in the 80s. Uh, it tells you how old I am. It's OK. I don't mind. Yeah. They used to say, quote unquote, the mosques are not cool. That was the you know, 24, 25 year old Muslims. You know, the mosque is not cool. I can't bond to the Imam. Man. He's talking Arabic. So if you're from an Arab community, he's talking Arabic. I, yeah, I have no clue what he's saying. And the other guys are saying, he's talking Urdu. And I don't even know what he's talking about. I can barely understand my mom talking Urdu. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I go to my aunt's house, I don't even understand their tongue, their language. All right. So the youth were going to the, to the universities and saying, no. The mosque is not, it's not that we don't like it, it's just not cool. I don't know if you all, you all use also the word cool, K-E-W-L. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, know, I, I know it's old. I know some of you are saying, man, you're old. You know, we're already like, you know, you already went beyond these, these terms. I understand, but that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> it's not cool. So you tell them, hey, why don't we try to go to the masjid? Hey, brother, the masjid is not cool. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 you know, I, I go there, it's boring, you know, I just wait to, you know. So, you know, if you force them to say, all right, I'll just go to the prayer. I don't want to go and hear the chutbah. I don't even understand the melody, what he's going to say, you know. That was up until recently, maybe 10 years ago, where I started seeing a shift. The shift is no longer the, mo the mosque is not cool. The deen is not cool. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am saying is, I believe, and may Allah make me wrong, say I mean. It's okay, I like to be wrong sometimes. I do. There is a silent, progressive, silent yet progressive wave of not secularism, but of atheism yes. that you will be facing in the 21st century. From within the Muslim community, it will affect it. There's no, it's inevitable. You live in a society. When you live in a society, you're going to take in part many things the society has. There is a silent, yet gaining momentum, progressive, powerful eventually, wave of not secularism anymore, but atheism, anti-religion, period, and specifically anti-Islam. That's going to come soon to a theater near you. And we're not prepared. <laughs> we're just a flooding, you know, where do you put your hand? Above the navel or below the navel? Do you put your imama this way or that way? Do you put the shah this way? Oh, you're this and this. <laughs> we're nowhere close. Because we're looking at each other with a microscope. Oh, he's got problems. Hey, you better believe it, because if you turn that microscope to you, you'll see lots of problems, too. That's a challenge. 
And that's why among the things that we need to be able to respond, number one, you as youth need to equip yourself with a couple of things that are very important for this. It's the, it's the realization of the authentic hadith where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us there will be times when people in the morning are mu'mins, they have belief, and at night they become beliefless, faithless. It's because we rendered the deen, we dwarf the deen into rituals. Do's and don'ts. You teach them how to talk about Allah and how to, subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but they don't have any feeling. It's all from the tongue and the mind. The heart is totally detached. We're opening madaris and madrasas and schools to teach people to memorize the Quran. They're coming out beautiful. They memorize the whole book from A till the end, from the beginning till the end. They will recite it to you in the best melody out of their tongues, but their heart is singing a different melody. The mullahs, which obviously we're all part of here, <laughs> in my view also bear half of the responsibility for driving people out of Islam and away from Islam because of religious tyranny. Religious tyranny. Pharaoh. Pharaohs. This is the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You all, including all of us, we have to shape up to face a challenge that's coming to you and to all of us. You need to know who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all. Why is he worthy of worship? Why nothing else is worthy of worship but him? We gotta go back to the basics now. To the very basics, to the big basics. To the very important basics, to what makes you, why are you Muslim? Who is Allah that you're worshiping? Do you know about him and then do you know him? We need to go now to the spiritual aspect of Islam, to infuse that spirituality. You need to spend some time trying to know your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya akhi. You need to spend some time at night and pray, even if it's five minutes, trying to get to know your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to spend that time. You need to go and visit someone who's sick so you can find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the hadith tells you. Those are actual sunnahs that we're leaving behind. And then we're wondering, why is our iman in trouble? Why don't we have that iman? Where is that halawa? Where is that taste, sweetness of iman that Mustafa وسلم, promises us in the authentic narration? Where is that sweetness of iman? Where is that we find iman? Where is it? How come we're not finding it? I'll say whether some people like it or not. And again, it doesn't, I'm not infallible. Okay. I make mistakes. It's OK. I'm happy. I'm doing that. And I always say imperfection is perfect for me. But I believe. And again, that's my own sort of hunch and speculation. And may Allah Ta'ala make me wrong. That our challenge in this 21st century with spirituality, with void spirituality from the community, and just having it into rituals is going to be atheism, not secularism anymore. And I believe that, again, and therefore the battle is no longer, the theological battle is no longer the, Sun, the Sufi Salafi debate. Though, look, I think that we have sometimes irreconcilable differences in few issues. And I'm not here to tell you anything otherwise. I'm not telling you to tell you to, you know, melt or do or whatever it is or whatever. No, no. There's differences. But the, the challenge is not the Sufi Salafi debate as much. The challenge is not even the Sunni Shia debate, which we have irreconcilable differences as Al Sunnah with our Shia brothers. The challenge will be the actual belief in the Creator, God Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are running away from Allah. Now, you can fight all the battles you want, and there are many battles you can fight. And I'm not saying one should leave that issues or the issues of differences we have. No, no, don't. But prioritize. 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 You can't try to save the village 
when the house is on fire. Besides, that wave that will affect everyone, that wave of atheism that will affect people, you know, your people around you, your neighbors, you live in Britain. All of you, I assume, are English yeah. or British, let me say, sorry. Does that make a difference? Yes. No. Okay, so you're, in, you're British. Right. I know, because there's Scottish then and there's Northern, I know when I get in trouble. All right, so you're British, right? Well, don't you think your British non-Muslim neighbor has rights upon you? Don't you think they have rights upon you? Don't you think you really need to offer them something? Some, because your deen, your Islam gives people, offer, offer all people hope, growth, and opportunity. I'm not talking about indoctrination all the time. Come, become like this. One, two, three, da, 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 da. Don't you believe that they, they deserve you making du'a for them, that oh, Allah guide them by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they told him, Ya Rasulullah, make du'a against the Mushrikeen, he made du'a for them? At least. Don't you think that believing in the Creator would also help you if others believe around you? That makes your job easier. Don't you think that we need also to also positively contribute? to everything around us, those neighbors that we have. Yeah. Yes. If you're good to those who are good to you, then what good are you? Those people around you, you need to be good to them. And not in a dogmatic, theoretical way necessarily, but in a genuine, genuine well-being, the genuine care about their well-being, genuine care about their well-being and the well-being of their children and the well-being of the country that you're a part of. You gotta be careful of terrorism. I'm not saying that for any reason, don't worry. Nobody's paying me to say that. I don't mean actual terrorism, I mean verbal terrorism first. What do you mean verbal terrorism? When people terrorize each other within Muslims, verbally, you got a word, those are flags, those are red, red signs. Because usually, violence comes after that stuff. There's verbal violence before actual violence. That's not, our deen is not a deen of hate. It's not a deen of hate speech. It's not a deen of hopelessness. It's a deen of hope to everyone. Give hope. Give hope to everyone. Because it's not even your deen, it's the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't own the deen, it's his deen. You'll do good if you channel that mercy. <coughs> Those are some of the challenges we have. Be careful of, be careful of this sort of cult mentality of exclusion. Be careful of, of verbal, uh, verbal violence before actual violence. But I believe, again, I think things are going to only get worse, unfortunately. Yes. Again, that's my hunch. May Allah make me wrong. Things are going to get worse from all sides. And we have to at least be ready. Be ready to take our deen to, to people and present it. First of all, reform ourselves. Because we can't, we can't give others, we can't offer others love if we are void of love. We can't offer others hope if we ourselves abuse each other. We can't offer others opportunity if we ourselves try to deprive each other from opportunity. I say, and I will say that again, unity does not mean conformity. It's okay. If we learn anything from the Sahaba, is we learn that it is okay to look at the same thing and see it in two different ways. We have bigger things. Like I said, look around you and you'll see. I hope that you don't see that. But I see alarming signs everywhere I go in the world of a wave of atheism that's coming. 
lack of spirituality. We made the deen just do, 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 don't, 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 that's it, you're good. There's no more touch, there's no more spirituality, there's no more, there's no more that relationship that people have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, that relationship of emulating the Sahaba, the awliya, and al bayt all these people. You know, it becomes just dry. Do, don't, that's it. It's ilm, no more adab. Learn a couple of words, you become the man, the man of the time. Yeah. Ilm becomes information, not realization. What are you talking about realization? Forget realization. It's information. Information that has absolutely no transformation. <coughs> or little transformation. So therefore, you, will, you're, you could pray million years taraweeh, 20 rak'ah every day. Doesn't change you a bit. No habits are changed. No bad habits are changed. Nothing is changed. No transformation whatsoever. Year after year after year, nothing. We have a crisis. It's a spiritual crisis, in my view. Spiritual crisis. We either pay attention to it, or we'll all be responsible anyway. I mean, we're all going to be responsible regardless before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullukum masul al nabi. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, ra all of you are responsible. Hadith is Sahih. We're all responsible. We're responsible for our own well-being and the well-being of everyone around us, whether they're Muslims or not Muslims, whether they're humans or not humans. So, that starts with, first of all, reforming our own relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Signing a peace accord with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in, in a metaphorical sense. Saying, Ya Allah, I want to know you. I want to be close to you. I don't just want to know about you. I want to know you. I want to spend some time at night in Tahajjud, even if it's five minutes. Just me and you. No one else. Cry. Talk to him. Cry to him. Speak to him. Tell him what you want. Tell him what you feel. Talk to him. Don't just talk about him. Spend time talking to Allah at night. Ya Akhi is what I'm trying to tell you. Please, please. Don't just talk to people. Talk to Him, the creator of people. He listens to you. He knows what you want, but He wants you to talk to Him. He wants you to pray to Him. He wants you to make dua. Why do you think Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic hadith he tells us, Ad dua huwa al ibadah? With Hadith Hassan, where he says, Ad dua mukhul ibadah. A dua is ibadah. Why do you think he says that dua is the core of ibadah? Why? Why do you think he says that? Because of this. Because Allah wants you to talk to him. And make dua, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, complain, whatever you want. First, until you learn the other. But learn and talk. Take that tasbih, or if you don't want, if you think tasbih is bid'ah, though there is two authentic hadith almost, but anyway. If you think, use your hands, use your fingers, and make salat and salam on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's okay. Just send your, send your love. Don't send your words. Nobody wants your words. People want your love. Send your love, ya akhir. Bond. All right. There's no other way. And then reform others. I leave you with these thoughts. Jazakumullah khairan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No problem. MashaAllah, JazakAllah khayran. To say, Ma'ashaq, for giving us these vital and very important words, I sincerely hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me and you to implement in our lives the advice that MashaAq has given. And Allah Azza wa Jal make me and you closer to Him by proximity and truly find peace and tranquility in our lives and we receive salvation in the after through the instruction of the Sheikh. Before we leave, inshallah, we're going to have a few moments of questions and answers. Please keep the questions relevant to the topic, inshallah. Practical advice needs to be sought. Apart from our daily worship, what else can we do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm sure many of our questions have already been answered.
in what we share has said. But if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Send them to you. The Rabbi has a thing about modern technology, Marshall. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allah bless you. I always say, having a feeling is a great sign. And because the worst of signs is when you don't have a feeling. So, theologically speaking, the Quran Karim says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ if you were to tell them, don't cause evil and corruption on earth, they would say, we are but reformers. We are good people. And then Allah says, Ala innahum humul mufsidun. Indeed, they are the corrupt <coughs> that are causing corruption. And then Allah puts the reason why. وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُونَ But they don't even, they lost their feeling to see whether they're doing good or bad. And that's a bad stage. So, look, it fluctuates. And uh, uh, one thing about getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it fluctuates. It fluctuates based on, you're not supposed to be in the same station all your life. Maybe that station now, I mean, you pass one station, the, the station higher becomes it's better, but it's a different test. The test, the first grade test is not like the second grade test. And one needs to do better in the second grade, and the second grade test is not like the ninth grade test. We can't expect to always be in the first grade, and we want just to pass the test like that, and we say we want to remain in the first grade. We want to progress. And I, I won't, you know, take that maybe as a sign of, I, I don't know definitively, I'm just saying take that as a sign of progression rather than regression. Um, we will always fall because we're not perfect. We're perfect, actually, but we're not perfect. We're perfect in being imperfect and imperfect in being perfect. I don't know how we can understand that, but that's just what it is. I, I know. You can't look. That's what I say, so you can reject that. You don't have to accept that. It's not Quran or Sunnah. So, um, But I always say our path of perfection starts with falling, usually. Our path to perfection starts with sinning and, f and slipping, usually. Keep that in mind. Okay? Remember Adam, alayhi salam, our father. The path to perfection before he was living in Jannah. And then he did not follow the command. Mm -hmm. 
after that, so you and I, whatever consider that to be, after that, I don't want to go into the theological academy arguments now. After that, that detour, if you were to say, perfected him. ثُمَّ جِتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ Allah Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him even closer to him and made the malaika, the malaika who are infallible, who do not do any sins. And yet Adam alayhi did not follow the command. Allah made the malaika, the infallible ones, make sujood prostrate to Adam. The path of perfection sometimes may not look uh, the way we probably draw it in our minds. So keep that in mind. May Allah strengthen us all. But again, you know, we need to spend time, we need to spend quality time with Allah, is what I'm saying. Take that in a metaphorical way. In a sense that, spend quality time. Go home, put five minutes. I'm not asking you to put half an hour. Spend quality time. Many people, they spend time reading the Quran, but not, they're not with Allah. Many people spend time acquiring ilm and reading and memorizing, but they're not with Allah. Spend time with Allah, even if you don't say a word, you don't make any dhikr. Just contemplation. Contemplation itself is ibadah, is an act of worship. Just contemplate. If you don't want to say anything, don't say anything. Just spend time with Him. Obse what does that mean? Observing that you are observed. Observing His closeness to you. That's all. Yeah. Just on the whole thing. Sheikh, a few questions have arised. Uh, but I feel that uh, a lot of them are very similar. So please don't feel as if your question is not being addressed. If the word is specifically is not mentioned, my uh, blue light on the phone has been going a bit crazy. So there's a lot of questions that have come about. So I'm looking at the questions and I'm going to ask the questions which sort of tie in three or four different questions. Different wordings, but they sort of all have the same direction. What advice or guidance would you give for someone wanting to become steadfast in the theme but is easily distracted by the distractions around himself? Take the journey to Allah. Take the journey to him. Make finding him, quote unquote, metaphorically speaking, your goal in life. Like Salman, put yourself in the shoes of Sayyidina Salman. Look for him. Look for him. Ibrahim Nadam said I could, did not find him in the masjid. I had to look for him in the desert. Why do you think many of the Sufis in the old days of Allah Ta'ala Anhu, why do you think Sayyidina Al-Qadr Jilani, for example, they said that he stayed in seclusion for 25 years in Shillam? <laughs> why do you think that? Why do you think some of the Sufis used to be spent until now, they spend days and weeks and so on in seclusion? If you don't like the word Sufis, call it Tuskia, it's okay. I still love you, I have no problem. I don't get stuck on, on terms. Yeah, of course. Uh, why do you think that Mustafa sallallahu himself, before the announcement of the message, where do you used to spend a lot of time? In the cave, alone, for weeks at a time. Spend some time. Spend some time. Okay. So you're going to, how specifically can the atheist issue be tackled? Yeah, alhamdulillah, I've been sleepless about this for a few years now. Uh, not literally every day, but it's on my mind every day, and I put it in a big file in the computer in front of me when I open my computer. And I think about it all the time. It's very big, I think. Again, I, I, it's just a hunch. I could be wrong. Uh, I just see too many flags that reconfirm my suspicion. Um, it needs a lot of work, it needs all of us to work. And that's why we said, I said, I mean, we as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, while we do have <coughs> issues, serious, concrete issues, and sometimes irreconcilable differences with many of the groups out there, our focus at this point 
ought to be to the major things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The concept of Godhood, building that spiritual relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, through your salam, salam on him, etc., etc. Through your emulating. Building your relationship, you and the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very important. And that's where I believe our, our focus ought to be. A prioritize, not nothing else. How do we tackle that? I have a plan. <laughs> You know, Martin Luther King in Jr. in the U.S. used to say, I have a dream. So, I was, I, you know, I have, but I, it's not me. I, one can't do it all. You know, I need you. And Islam needs all of us. We can't, you know, we need to try to do something, all of us. Um, focusing on the basics. Focusing on the basics. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have a relationship with Allah. Be good to people. Be good to all people. I, I always say, be good to those who are worthy of receiving good and those who are not worthy of receiving good. If they're worthy of receiving good, then it went to its right people. If they're not worthy of receiving good, you ought to be worthy of doing good. Just do good. Allah will never forget, forget, forget you for that. In other words, Allah is not subject to forgetting anyway. But your good deed is never going to be forgotten. That's what I meant. Never. It will never be forgotten. Do good without anticipation for recognition. Don't worry about people recognizing you. That may chip away from what you do. Just do good and forget about it. Build. Alhamdulillah. Shaykh, the hadith relating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the broken hearted, with the sick. Is this only relating to the physically sick or spiritually? mentally, emotionally sick as well. How broken heart are you? Some people could be physically sick, but their, their heart is not broken. You see? And that's why the hadith, despite its weakness, it says uh, those whose hearts are broken. You know when you're broken? When, when is your heart broken? Right? So, you know, you know this from a human perspective now. When you love someone so much, and she doesn't recognize you. And then she goes away. She's slipping away from your hands, and you know, you, there's nothing you can do. You're broken. You want her so much, and so bad, yet, you know you can't. You just can't help it. That's when your heart is broken. That's when your love is the highest, almost. And this, that's why the, 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 the philosophers of Ish, if I may say, I don't want to go into these things now. We're not into so of things, you know, but I mean anyway. anyway. Sufism to me is an honor I cannot claim and an accusation I will not deny. Okay, so I'm not a Sufi in that sense, if you understand that. We try, we try to emulate these big people, brother. I mean, you know, we're not, you know. The big people are, but, you know, we're just emulators on the path. They say the highest point of love is that when you're broken heart, not when you actually are with your beloved necessarily. Depending on how you view, there's many madahib in this. How broken is your heart? Do you run from Allah or do you run to Allah? If you spend some time with Allah, are you bored now? You want to go, you want to get your, you want to have your uns and solace. You want to have your solace in the creation or do you actually Run to him for solace. The Sufis have a saying, they say, من علامة الإفلاس الاستئناس بالناس From the sign of bankruptcy, spiritual bankruptcy, is that you find solace in the creation rather than the creator. MashaAllah. Just before we uh, hear the announcements and inshallah stand briefly to send salutations on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, one final question because of the time restriction and the venue has to be given back. Sheikh, how do we close the gap between people on a day to day basis regarding this whole cult mentality? So, how do we close the gap of secular and cult issues around Muslim brothers and sisters around us on a day to day basis? I think it's important to realize that one ought to have their convictions. 
and one ought not to compromise on their convictions, especially if they can substantiate them. The theological convictions, especially the theoretical theological convictions, ought to never prevent you from doing good to everyone. Whether they're Muslims or not Muslims, regardless. Your theological conviction ought not, ought not, ought not to ever prevent you from being a positive contributor to your community and your society and the country that you live in and everybody and the animals and the plants. Allah gave us the rule. The rule is very simple. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adl. What does adl mean? Being just, right? You know what? You know why Allah puts just for first? Because you always lack others to treat you with justice. But oftentimes we don't treat others with justice. You don't want anyone to talk bad about you. You don't want anyone. You get actually hurt if, you talk, if someone talks bad about you. But you don't care about talking about other people. Allah, inna Allah ya'muru bil adl. Allah orders you to be just on yourself first. On yourself. You worry about perfecting yourself. You worry about being just with yourself. Then Allah says in line of Adli wal ihsan. I'll tell you why Adl is very important, why being just is very important. Look, Allah created this universe in a very balanced, in, in a, based on justice, on Adl. Justice is how this universe is done. If you create injustice, you will pay for it dearly. Allah is my witness. If you do injustice to others, whether they're Muslims or not Muslims, whether they're animals or human beings, whether they're plants, if you do aggression and injustice against others, you will pay in the dunya and in the akhirah, both. In other words, there will be ramifications. I don't have time now to explain to you and give you the evidence. I have the need from the Quran and the Sunnah. Some other time, maybe. You will pay for it. There's no getting away with it. If you think you're going to get away with doing wrong, you may be doubting the justice of Allah. Allah is just, If you do an atom worth of good, you'll see. If you do an atom worth of evil, you shall see. Don't do injustice against others, especially those you don't like. Don't. You will pay for it. You will pay for it dearly. Hadith Sahih, the Lula Malay Muflis. I'm just saying, there's so many, too many signs. Be careful. Because if you do injustice, guess what? Who's the first who's going to pay? You will pay. You're going to be losing, not them. Even if it may seem that they lost, you lose. You're tipping the imbalance. You're, you're, ba you're tipping the balance. You're imbalancing things. And there's no way. You, there's no way you can get away with it. There's no way. There's just no way. All right, so that's important. The second thing, Ihsan. Ihsan means, so first justice, then Ihsan. So justice is that you're good to those who are good to you. That's what justice means. If you're good to me, I'm good to you. But then Allah goes to say, Allah orders you also to treat people with Ihsan. Or everything with Ihsan. Ihsan means that you're good to those who are not good to you. You're good to those who are not good to you. Wow. That's difficult. Hi. Jazakum Allah khair and Sayyidina Sheikh. Again, I sincerely hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me and you to implement in our lives the uh, advice and uh, the nasiha that the Sheikh has given us. Please listen to these announcements before you 